hello uh, and welcome to the, the final lecture of the uh, Red Bull Music Academy Weekender uh, Belfast. I'm uh, really honored to be joined by uh, DJ Pioneer in the UK, Greg Wilson. Hiya, nice to meet you. Um, I wanted to begin by connecting a little bit to Noel's uh, yep. uh, lecture. He talked uh, and he did uh, some mixing for the Street Sounds compilations yeah. um, back in mid-80s, I guess? Yeah, so? 85, I think you would have done that. Yeah, and you've written extensively about the impact of that compilation. And well, I'm it was a series of compilations. Um, it, 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 for a start, it was like uh, the, the first kind of successful series of dance music compilations. It was the first series of dance compilations that were mixed as well. Um, it was a guy called Morgan Kahn who came up with the idea and I mean a lot of these tracks were only available on import and they were expensive. Imports cost twice the amount of a British release so if you were trying to buy these records just as a normal person not as a DJ you know it took a lot of money so he came up with the idea of um, let's get these imports put them on an album maybe have eight tracks that would cost, you know, for the cost of two tracks. And um, it was just a, a winner. He also did a, a series called Street Sounds, which, which was um, dealing with the more kind of street soul based stuff and high energy, I mean, all sorts of spin offs. But the Electro series, my phone, <laughs> let me turn that off. There we go. The Electro series, which um, was basically, um, you know, the, the one that um, Noel was involved in um, really caught the imagination. And that was almost like the um, soundtrack for the the, break, the original breakdance era. Uh, it was like there was, um, you know, kids up and down the country who were like putting ghetto blasters on the street and were just like getting some lino out and, and, and breakdancing. And that was the perfect format. I would imagine cassette sales were, were probably as, as strong in many respects as, as vinyl sales because this is what the usage was. And, and later down the line when, you know, the, um, you know, people started to look at the history of dance culture, especially with regards to what happened in the, in the late 80s, you know, it, it, was, it was a huge omission, a massive omission that street sounds and what that represented, you know, wasn't there within the, within the story. It was kind of sidelined for the, the whole Ibiza narrative of, of, of how things turned out, so. Yeah, I was looking at the comments to a post you had put on your website, um, and it, it was amazing to see, you know, five or six people that were like, yes, that was the compilation for me, and like, no one talks about it anymore. I mean, I mean the, these were charts albums. These weren't like kind of something that sold a few thousand copies. These were getting in, you know, like the top 20 of, of the British album charts. They, these were huge records. Um, so you know, it's not surprising that a lot of people from that era, um, w when they saw that being written about, it was like, well, yeah, of course that happened. But it was still very much, um, dance culture was very much an underground thing at the time still. Um, it wasn't until later that, um, you know, with the advent of the, the whole acid house rave scene, that it went overground and just became you know, something that, that was a more, more of a commercial force at that point. What's been the impulse for you to, uh, I mean, obviously your love of music to go get back into the DJing game, I understand that. What is the impulse for you to write about it so much on your website and document these things? I mean, maybe it's important to me that, you know, if I'm interested in history of music and, and you know, for example, I'm, I'm like massively into like what happened in the 60s and, you know, just obsessive. I can read any amount of, of books on that period of time. That, you know, I, when, when you see things that, it, it's almost like, I, I say this a lot, but to know the future first, you must know the past. If it's a wrong past, or if it's a past that's missing big chunks of it, you, you can never look ahead properly. Um, so, you know, from my point of view, when I came back into DJing, which was just over 10 years ago, um, a lot of the reason behind that was because I'd got, you know, I've got a computer, started to go online, see what's happening on the internet, realize that um, dance culture now was being documented in a historic way and seeing these emissions. And, you know, at that point, 
you could either just sit and moan about it, or in my case, I, I knew that I had all my archive material from the early 80s period and that I could put together a website that, that basically was a starting point there that showed you how it led to that period of time and explained how things came out of that. And so that, that's what I did, basically. I went back and, and, and that was what brought me back into DJing because when I'd set the website up, then people would say to me, would you like to DJ? And then it became worthwhile to do that. There was a reason to do that and to kind of point a finger back to these times so people could see it. Because as I say, up until that point, I think the narrative was very much the Ibiza one, um, which, which was really important. But it wasn't about bringing the music back. All oh, right, there was a Balearic edge to, to, to music, but a lot of people thought it was uh, the house music that came back from Ibiza, whereas really what, what came back from Ibiza was ecstasy, and the house music was already in place. But, it, I mean, that, that's what it was. It was like, you know, like on the underground scene, uh, certainly in the North and Midlands, I mean, there was a different lineage in London. Uh, not many people were actually playing house. Noel uh, and, and Morris w w were two of the people that were, but uh, as he probably told you himself, you know, there was a lot of resistance to that at the time in London, whereas in the North and Midlands, that there was already established networks between places like Sheffield, Nottingham, Birmingham, Leeds, Bradford, Huddersfield, Manchester. Uh, there was an, an all-day scene that was going on. This goes back to the jazz funk days. And house music was just played on the back of the electro. We were talking about the electro albums, House, initially, before there was a term house, it was just another form of electro that people found out came from a different city, which happened to be Chicago, and techno being Detroit as well. But it was all under the same umbrella. I mean, the f one of the first um, techno records was Cybertron Clear, which was I played myself in 1983 as an electro track. I wasn't even aware it, it, it wasn't. I, I, I didn't know it was from a different city at the time. It just fitted in exactly with that. And that's what happened uh, in the North and Midlands. Um, the, the lineage in London was different. What broke it in London and made it different to what was happening where we were was that um, the rare groove scene was so big. So that was almost like London's Northern Soul. It was like going back and finding older records and, and creating a vibe and a scene around that. Um, and, and that was so huge during that kind of mid-80s period um, that that took precedence on things. and that. that cause a different narrative there. Um, I mean, the house music predominantly, from a London perspective, you know, was originally played within the gay clubs, whereas house music from a northern and Midlands perspective was played in the black clubs. So that, that's probably the difference of the two. Yeah, I mean, that was quite an interesting thing to me, is that uh, outside of London, uh, black audiences in the UK, at least in the north, were cottoning onto house music first. Yep. But it was the exact opposite. Why do you think uh, house music in the North caught these audiences? Well, I mean, as I say, I think it was the, the electro lineage. I think it, it, electro also had a different um, effect in the North than the South. And the reason for that was, I mean, don't get me wrong, there was a lot of people in the South that were really into electro. Uh, but, you know, if you go back to, say, 1982, when the first electro records appeared, how the scene worked, the black music scene in the UK was, the South and the North were separate. The DJs didn't kind of very often go between the two. It wasn't like nowadays. So you didn't play very much in London? No, I never played at all in London. I mean, I played one time in London just before I stopped DJing, and that was part of the Hacienda tour when I did Camden Palace. Uh, but never apart from that, I mean, I, I can think of two or three London DJs who came up to the North during that period. It was very rare. It was a real rare occurrence. Um, and, and in London, there was a group of DJs called the Soul Mafia. Chris Hill, Froggy, uh, people like Pete Tong. Pete Tong was the young guy from the Soul Mafia. Um, Jeff Young, you know, Tom Holland, all these people were. And, and they had like a lot of power on the scene. They'd sussed out how to promote as well as to DJ almost. Uh, they, they, there was a, you know, um, company called Showstopper Promotions that were putting on weekenders, you know. I mean, there was all day events in the North and the South, but they, they, they'd taken it to another level. And I'd say that um, Chris Hill, the DJ Chris Hill, was probably the first superstar DJ in this country in this respect. He, he, he was way ahead of the curve with what he was doing. So they, they were a, power, a powerful force, and, and they had uh, a lot of power within the media. So Blues and Soul magazine, 
the London stations that played black music, Radio London and Capital, Robbie Vincent and Greg Edwards, these were all connected into the soul mafia. Um, and they were anti-electro. Their initial stance was that they didn't like this, um, how they saw as, you know, kind of machine music. They thought it had no value with regards to soul. a little bit more robotic. Yeah, they, I mean, they just thought it... They, to, to their belief, you know, soul was about songs and instrumentation and everything, and this was something different. Whereas, as a younger DJ, the way that I looked upon it was that, for me, I mean, I, I was a big soul fan as a kid growing up, and, you know, Stax Records and obviously Motown and stuff, and, you know, the raw edge of something like, um, Stax, like Otis Redding and stuff like that, I could hear that in the electro. Whereas, the contemporary soul music of the time, you know, Luther Vandross, Alexander O'Neill, these people, incredible voices, but it was over lush production. It was now aspirational black music. It was almost black yuppie music in a sense that it, it, it was so smooth that it was almost bland in a sense. And this is what they were kind of hanging, hanging on to. Whereas this new vibrant New York kind of cutting edge music being made from the street, you know, th this is this is where I. So it's kind of the it. same attitude as well from the. This is the raw. Yeah, that's know. how I saw it, and and so f we we embraced it completely, and it but it took longer. I mean, for example, those electro albums that you're talking about. Um, the first one was in October '83, whereas, you know, what's seen as the the track that really kicked off the whole electro thing, Planet Rock by Africa Bombarda and the Soul Sonic Force, was. Um, that came in on import in May 82, so we're talking over a year. Uh, Morgan Khan, you know, saw the commercial possibility of this by then, and he, by 84, um, you know, like that old soul mafia thing had all, almost been swept aside, and, and the new breed came through. You know, that's where DJs like Tim Westwood came from, because they, again, they embraced this new sound that was coming out, and, and Electro was... Um, the vehicle also that really brought hip hop into its own, you know, things like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, the message, you know, it's kind of electronic backing and, you know, um, Run DMC, you know, one of the, 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 the first big single was It's Like That, which was, was played as an electro track. So a lot of hip hop kind of emerged out of electro as well. Um, and, and, and so there was a, a, a massive change in London. I mean, all this, the people that were playing this music were doing so, for example, on pirate radio, and it was, it was hidden in the shadows. Whereas, you know, for example, I, I did mixes for Piccadilly Radio playing this music, um, and this was the second most popular commercial radio station in the country outside of Capital Records in London. So, um, Capital Radio in London. So, so, um, Really, you know, we, we'd got it to a certain level already before, before London was like really embracing it. And, 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 and that was purely down, in my opinion, to the stranglehold on the scene that the Soul Mafia guys had, you know. And you also mentioned it extended to the media in some sense. Um, in the North, obviously, pirate radio was a We big didn't thing. have really pirate radio. No. Um, the, the, it was, that was a more, more of a, a London phenomenon. I mean, it was only later that a few pirates emerged, you know, in Manchester and places like that, but that wasn't really what was happening from our side of things. So how was what you guys were doing up there uh, spreading? How were these messages spreading? Well, it, it was an underground scene, which meant that if you didn't read a magazine like Blues and Soul, if you didn't listen, say, if you were in Manchester to, um, to Mike Schaff's show on Piccadilly Radio, or if you're in Liverpool, Terry Lanane on Radio Merseyside, these different regions had DJs who were playing specialist black music, uh, or you know you hadn't had the fortune of meeting somebody who hooked you into these kind of clubs. Um, the, the, you probably missed them completely in a sense. You, you you might not have even known that it was it was going on. But there was, as I say, there was um, this huge kind of subculture that had um, developed over a, a period of time with you know a whole series of. I mean. At one point, literally every weekend, there was an all day somewhere. So if it was Sheffield this week, next week it was Nottingham, and the week after it was Manchester. So, and, and how all day has worked was that um, the most popular DJs in the region would come together in one place. So 
and draw their crowds with them. I mean, we, we used to organize coaches for the people from, from our clubs, you know, and um, so it was this coming together. I mean, it's a shame almost that something similar hasn't existed more recently. I mean, I remember, you know, like when I came back into things about 10 years ago and the, the, this emerging disco scene and stuff, you'd see people doing events maybe in Newcastle or in, in Glasgow, Edinburgh and these kind of places. And, you know, I'd always think, you know, those, what if those guys took a venue kind of central to all those and brought all their, and that's what, what it was like, brought all their people together. Because then everything starts to cross pollinate from there. So the guys from Newcastle might check out the club in Glasgow and so it, it, it worked on the club side. People would go I think to it's the club uh, festivals. I mean, obviously, people are willing to travel to festivals. Well, I think things, but festivals is the modern phenomenon. I think yeah. festivals is where youth culture is now. You know, it's so big, and it's like a rites of passage for younger people and everything. I think this is, you know, where we are now. So, in a sense, but but this was more kind of bespoke because it was a certain type of music, it was the DJs that worked on, on, on this, it was a specialist scene. I mean, for example, you, you had to, you know, you had to, um, to buy these records, they didn't come cheap, you know, I mean, you know, I'd spend a hundred pounds worth of record a week, and, and, and that doesn't seem a lot now, but back then, you know, most DJs would, you know, were lucky if they got 20 pound a night. So, you know, I, I was fortunate, I, was, I could make a little bit more, I had a residency at Wigan Pier and I had Legend as well. But a lot of that money went into, you had to have the music, you know, you literally, you know, I, there was always, there was a famous occasion where I came up um, against, you know, that, there was one shop in the north of England where you, you had to go for, for your records. Um, if you were serious about, you know, uh, being respected as, as a specialist black music DJ, there's a place called Spinning in Manchester. And I, you know, I clashed a little bit with the manager. I was a young guy and maybe different ideas. And you know, as, as it goes, people see things in a different way. And I remember one night I'd, I'd gone into, I was at the club one night and it was a track by Arthur Adams called You Got The Floor. And it was, it, some, somebody came in and said, have you got this Arthur Adams track, You Got The Floor? And I'm like, no, no what, what, what's that? And he's like, oh yeah, it's great, blah, blah, blah. We heard it last night because there was another big club in town at the time called The Main Event. I'm thinking, why haven't I heard this track? So, you know, next day I ring the record show. Arthur Adams, you got the floor. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, you must have run out when you got in. Um, we'll, we'll put one aside for you. Okay. So I go to pick my records up the next week. And he said, oh, it hasn't come in the shop yet. So I'm thinking, oh, God, you know, I haven't got this record. And everyone's raving about it. And the night that I was working, someone else comes up. If you got Arthur Adams, you got the floor. Fred, I haven't got it. And this was like a, a, like a, see, a normal punter, not a DJ or anything. And he said, I've just got one in the car. I got it from spinning yesterday. I, I was livid. I, you know, I actually played his copy that night, but I, I was like in there and saying, what, what's, what are, you, are you holding this record back? And, I, and, and that made a decision in me. You know, I, I went to the manager of the shop and I said, look, and, and, and at that point, he, he made sure that everything that come, came in, that I had a first shout, because I was spending enough money and, and you know, uh, and, and it was important that I had these, but it also made me think. Well, to he you know, to kind of cover my back, I used to shop in London as well. I'd make sure I go to London every few weeks just to check off the, the things there, and and so it, you know, it made me like look at things in a bit of a different way. But again, the guy, you know, later we clashed further along the line with the electro thing because he was completely anti-electro, and he even put in the shop window, although they were selling this music and there was a massive demand for it, electro shit chart. It was like. Just grinding it down as though it was worthless and <laughs> so nothing. He's selling it, he's stocking it, yeah. but he's saying you shouldn't buy it. Or exactly. I mean, I remember, I, I remember going in and buying Planet Rock, and I know that as I walked out, he he was just looking at me and thinking, you know, a fool parted with his money, you know, like because to them Planet Rock was well, it was coming, you know, from a craft work basis and. It wasn't black music to them. They didn't see this as anything. It was just this novelty, gimmicky thing. But really, now we know historically, this is, you know, it, for me, it's one of the most important records of the 20th century because it is right at the start of that kind of electronic dance. You know, it, it, it defined a new era, it defined a new way of making music, a new approach, and everything. And things changed after that forever. You know, the, you can go back and look at pre planet rock at the music that was being made. I mean, I did a a series online called Early 80s Floor Fillers, where, again, I went through all my record lists and I compiled a top 10 for each month through 82 and 83. And if you start at the beginning of 82, there's still a lot of jazz records being played on the black music scene. 
but you go like to the you know like the end of that year and you're just seeing a completely different you know so many electronic tracks are coming into play and everything and so there was a massive massive change over at that point um tell me about uh, Wigan Pier you mentioned that yeah Wigan Pier w was a club in Wigan um that a lot of people make the mistake of thinking I was at Wigan Casino. Wigan, Casi Wigan Pier and Wigan Casino were chalk and cheese. There were two different things. Casino was an old, dilapidated, rundown ballroom playing, you know, like 60s rarities over a bit of a tinny old sound system. Um, Wigan Pier was a state-of-the-art American-style disco that they, they, they based around what was going on in New York, you know, your venues like your Paradise Garages and Studio 54s, and these, these clubs had emerged in the 70s, putting the sound equipment in, putting the emphasis on sound and light, light and stuff. How did that happen in Wigan? Like, what, <laughs> who was going to New York and saying, we need to have this it, here? It was a complete accident, apparently. The, 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 the guy who owned the club, there was a, a stockist of, of uh, disco equipment called Roger Squires in Manchester, and like every other club, he was going to Roger Squires. And I don't know how it happened, but he... he bumped into somebody who worked for a company called Bacchus. And Bacchus used to fit Hilton hotels and, and venues all around the world with like latest kind of equipment. And this guy persuaded him into, for example, getting the first laser system in a British club. I mean, it, it, it was way ahead of the curve, you know. I mean, I, I'd, I'd gone to work in Europe by this point. And when I say go to, it's not like now where they fly you over, they put you in a nice hotel and look after you. I mean, I mean you drove to Europe and you work like six, seven nights a week in a club, you know, between nine and five in the morning. And you slept in some grotty little back room somewhere. It was, there, were, there were loads of, 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 of British DJs out there doing that at the time, all over Scandinavia. You know, I think, I often think that whole the kind of Scandinavian disco thing that came out, that's part of the reason because of, um, these DJs that came before, you know. And so I was over there at the time. I decided, you know, I'm going to try it, see how it works out there. And, but I, I still wanted to be in the UK. But, you know, at the time, as I say, being a DJ, it wasn't a lucrative business, you know. The, 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 it wasn't like it is now. Um, and so but I, I had a, I say I had my car out there and I had, had a bump in the car and had to bring the car back to get it repaired and changed. And while I was back, um, a, a guy that I'd met during my first trip to, to Norway, um, I tried to get in touch with him and found out he was at this club Wigan Pier. And it was not far from where I, I was in, in Liverpool. So I went to see him and I just saw this club and I was like, oh my God, this is it. You know, they're, they're just incredible kind of lighting and sound. And the DJ was in on, on this balcony in this 15 foot high fiberglass frog. You know, it was like bizarre kind of, and they had monitors in and things. You, you never saw monitors in clubs at the time. It had um, very speed turntables that you didn't see in clubs, you know, or, or, or by and large in clubs. And, and, and everything was just set right. And, and he told me that he was going to take a new club by the same company in Manchester called Legend. And that there was going to be, um, you know, like a, a vacancy for, for the job. And, and he said, why don't you audition for it? They're doing auditions next week. And I'm like, well, I'm going back out to Germany next week. And I'm thinking, and I actually considered not going to Germany, just to, to try to do the audition because I was so into it. But I couldn't do that. So... But I said to the, the owner, I said, look, can I, you know, if I can do a cassette or something and send you a cassette as a demo? And he said, yeah, 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 okay. And so that's what I did. And unfortunately, I got the job on the back of that. And I came to this working four nights a week residency straight away financially. As I said, most DJs there got, I uh, think, if you got 20 quid for a night, that was a really good, a good crack. But, you know, I was getting like, what, £42.50 a night, you know, over the residency, and I was doing the four nights there, so I was, like, sorted on that level. And one of the nights was the jazz funk night, the Tuesday night, uh, and that was my favourite night because it was the type of music that I was into. And then a little later down the line, you know, the same company as I said, Own Legend, they had a Wednesday jazz funk night, and um, that was struggling. That had, had done well, and now the DJ there, a very famous DJ of the time called John Grant, had left and, and gone to another club, taken the crowd with them, and I was given a failing club, but managed to turn that, and that became my great, great night, the Wednesday at Legend. How did you get into jazz funk originally? Well, I mean, I was always, like, from being very young, you know, black music fan, my brother and my sister, um, the, the records that they bought when they were in their teens, they were older than me, 
was like um, Stax Atlantic, Motown, Trojan reggae stuff. And this is, I was kind of inheriting these, these great seven inch singles. And so that was musically, that was really my first love. And, and I just followed that through and, you know, looked, you know, when I started buying records myself, I was about 11 when I started buying records, I'd, I'd go and look around and go in the bargain bins and find, you know, like these soul records. And then I start listening to the radio shows, reading Blues and Soul magazine. And so that was the direction. So by the time I started DJ myself, which was in 75, coming to the end of the 70s, I think what happened was that disco, obviously I just started as disco was coming. I mean, I think the, the month I started was the month Donna Summer released I Love to Love You Baby. So it's, it's kind of the start of, of that real era coming through. And, but when Saturday Night Fever came out, although at first, it was great that there were, here was a film that was depicting, you know, this kind of culture that we were a part of. Very quick, quickly, it brought in what we saw as like a wrong aspect, people latching onto the film, people dressing in, you know, like sometimes now and then someone coming like medallion man and stuff, and it was getting a bit crassy, you know. I, I always see it that way that in the end, the symbolism of what disco originally was, which was like an afro hair black kid, you know, like kind of dancing to, you know, it became like this white suited white guy with his hand in the air, you know, and it, it, it changed with that. And, and it made it very uncool all of a sudden, you know, like um, there was those connotations with it. And I think a lot of the, the, the kind of cooler kids at that point started moving towards jazz funk and listening to that music. So, so that, you know, I kind of went with that lineage. And although I wasn't in a, a venue of the level of a Wigan peer or a legend at the time, I was still in my hometown that I was able to start to introduce these records and play them within that. And, you know, one of my proudest moments was that Blues and Soul actually come to my little backwater club and recommended it. And it was like, wow, you know, and that was like before, just before I went, went abroad and everything. So, so yeah, I aspired to that. I mean, I always tell this story. I, I mean, when I did the Academy in Melbourne back about, what, must be about eight, eight years ago, I, I told the story about um, when in Liverpool, there was a club called The Timepiece, in the in the um, 70s and it was a funk club and the DJ was a guy called Les Spain and it was a predominantly black club and I went there when I was 16 I was taken in by some older DJs and it, w it was one of those occasions where you go into an environment and all of a sudden you're thinking oh am, am I out my depth here because there were very few white people um, and I hadn't been in an environment as a white white guy where I was I was in the minority. It helped me understand how a lot of black people must have felt being put in a situation where they were in the minority in most in most circumstances. But amidst that was the music that was playing was exactly what I was into, exactly what I was about. And th th this DJ Les Spain, he was like a larger than life character, and it, he they did all nighters, and so all the like Liverpool DJs from different clubs would come at the end of their night and, and they were all stood around the booth and looking up to him and asking what's that record and writing it down. He was quite happy to give them this, this information but you know he was like the, the Don but he was so welcoming to everyone, so embraced and like me as a 16 year old introduced to him, treated me with respect you know not like I was some little nothing. I, you know we always felt that with him. I mean, he's still a friend to this day. He went on to work for Motown and he managed the, the, the reggae band Aswad and he's still involved in the music business today. And, and when I saw what was going on there, that was it. That, that, that's what I wanted. That's what I aspired to. I wanted something like I saw there. And that's what I eventually managed to get at Legend. I managed to get my timepiece when I, a little bit later down the line. You mentioned, you keep mentioning Blues and Soul magazine. How important was that at the time? Blues and Soul was the, was the DJ's Bible. There was no mixed mag DJ magazine, all those things then. So Blues and Soul, and, and, and one of the big things in Blues and Soul was that DJ, this is where I heard about DJ like Chris Hill and these guys in London, was that they, there were charts, that a DJ could submit a chart, a top 10. I'd put mine in all the time, you know, like, and, and, and so there'd be like these two pages of DJ charts that, um, that you could like read for a start. Um, so that alongside with Record Mirror, uh, the, there was a disco page in Record Mirror by a guy called James Hamilton, who's probably one of the most important people ever in British dance culture, but, but not many people would know. He dates back to the early 60s and the R&B scene at a place called The Scene in London. And, um, 
and, and so this was where your sources of, of information came from. Like Blues and Soul, for example, would, would print a, a, a UK soul chart, which were all the records released in the UK, but also the US. So you'd see what was released there and, you know, latest record review, all sorts of kind of interviews and stuff like that. A lot of adverts for clubs, clubs advertising. It, it was at that point in time, it was the DJ Bible. You had to, again, if you were a specialist in black music, you had to read that. You know, there was no, no way around it. Why was James Hamilton so important? Right, well, for a start, he was uh, with a guy called Guy Stevens. Um, I mean, I look at the, when I say the foundation of, 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 of UK club culture, um, I think you can take it to the scene in London, which was the mod club of the early 60s. And you can also take it to the Twisted Wheel in Manchester with a, with a guy called Roger Eagles. These are the first people that were importing um, American records in. It wasn't enough to just buy what's coming out in Britain. They, they had to get to source and get these records. So, you know, Twisted Wheel, for example, that, that's where Northern Soul comes from. It's from that venue where eventually they got so obsessive about this music that they wanted to dig back and back and find these rarer records and, and it came through from there. So James Hamilton was one of the DJs at the scene but, but later turns up, you know, like at the start of the disco era writing for Record Mirror. He used to, he, before that he was doing uh, US import reviews for Record Mirror as well. Record Mirror is a really important magazine in terms of dance music. They were always pro-dance, you know, like magazines like, say, NME or Melody Maker, they, they, they ignored it, you know, for probably until really the, the 80s and hip hop came through, you know, and, and then the rave scene eventually. But, but Record Mirror was always like um, supportive of, of disco and dance music as, as it evolved. And James Hamilton was central. I mean, he was the guy who, who BPMs, he, he, he started listing beats per minute obsessively. I mean, you'd see him, he's this big, taller, you know, he was about six foot six, larger than life, m mad character, you know, like, and, um, very far back voice and he'd, he'd stand there in like Groove Records in London with a stopwatch just BPM in records counting the BPMs and, and, and he went on an obsessive mission and, and he was the one who I think who pushed mixing in the UK because initially it was just seen as a fad from America and British DJs used the microphone and nobody saw the reason to change and we didn't have the equipment, the very speed turntables. So when mix, you know, the idea of mixing came out and people give it a go on these belt driven turns and try to touch the, you know, the needle a jump and, you know, so everyone like stuck to that. But he, he pushed that through and pushed that through until eventually, you know, it, it really started to kind of come in. So he was a, a real champion of uh, New York dance culture as well. And um, so many different things with him. And, you know, he is, he has become obscured in the history, but I mean, he's massive. He's, he's one of the key figures. Without him, it would be a different culture. One of the things that I think is regarded as one of your, your massive uh, contributions to dance music history is you were the first uh, DJ on television to, to mix. Obviously, people can go and look up that story. Uh, I just wonder if you remember that day specifically. <laughs> yeah, I remember that day. It was the scariest day of my life. It was, I mean, I see people now like Boiler Room and all that, and they do that. It was, it was like that, but before, uh, you know, I, I, it was hard for me to get my head around some of that Boiler Room at first, the idea that somebody wants to watch a DJ play, because when I started out, DJs weren't on a kind of central stage and everyone looking at them, they were in a dark corner. And that's why I, I actually prefer that, you know, the, just the music speaking for itself, DJ out of the way. So all of a sudden, there's this, like, massive scrutiny. I remember, like, how it all came about. I did the Wednesdays at Legend, which was, like, the specialist black, black music night. And there was a new British release um, by an artist called David Joseph, who'd had success previously with a band called High Tension, but this was his first solo single. And I'd been sent copies of it by the record company. As of what I got records from all the British companies, but, you know, it was only tracks like this that I'd play on British releases, all the stuff was imported, you know, so if it was a British artist like this, and it was a really good track, You Can't Hide Your Love. And so, what I used to do at the time, I'd started mixing by this point, I used to play around with two copies of a record, so I'd run one behind the other, either four beats, two beats, or a beat, you know, and, or, and switch it around, maybe kind of extend it, just, it was almost like a kind of live remix, in a sense, and, and, and this night, um, he, David Joseph had come to Manchester to do a personal appearance. We used to get artists who'd just come in for, for prom. We didn't even pay them 
you know, and we had people like Gwen Guthrie, Oliver Cheatham, you know, even Cool and the Gang came in at one point, and they, they, they just, the, the record company would get them in there to help promote m any number of British artists, of which David Joseph was one. Now, The Tube was in Newcastle, the TV programme. It was the biggest music programme at the time on the TV, and they were going to have him on um, from, they, they were going to do an outside broadcast from Camden Palace. I was actually in the studio in Newcastle. And they, so they were going to have him on for this. They wanted to come and check him out and see what he did. And they came to Legend and they heard me playing these two copies of the record. And they went, that might be an idea to have him on in Newcastle playing the record and then go to David Joseph in Camden Palace. So they approached me and they said, you know, how do you fancy doing it? And of course you go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you go home and you go, oh my God, you know, I mean, I'm going to be doing this in front of all my contemporaries. What if it goes wrong? Oh no, you know, like, it's like the fear of the situation at the time. What, look, all right, Melon, if, you know, if, if something happens. I remember going there and we, I took my equipment, I had this console, I took, I took my Revox up there and we set it all up. And uh, Jules Holland was the guy who did the interview. He's, um, and, and, and all through that, all through the, the conversation and everything before we even were interviewing, I'm just looking at my decks and I've got everything queued up. And what was scaring me more than anything was there was a guy with a handheld camera and he was going incredibly close to things. And I'm thinking, please, you know, don't bang that, you know. And so it got to the point where he said, you know, 10 seconds before on air. And, and that, I think that's, the, you know, the most fearful moment of my life, just the, oh, God, you know, I'm, I've got to go for this. And so, did it. And, and the cameraman did, did bang it. And the record held. And that, you know, SL1200s, you know, just just sturdiness of it. it. It saved my life. Because if that would have jumped, I was, I would have had to kind of be on the hop trying to get... I wasn't no turntablist who could just drop the needle on the right beat or anything. You know, it was still, you know, kind of infancy of mixing and stuff. And everything went fine in the end, and it worked out great. And uh, I remember going... I did a, a club in Manchester that night called The Exit. And, you know, I remember as I walked in, a lot of people kind of pat me on the back and saying, well done, and it was, you know, it had been a success and everything. And, and it, you know, it's the first time that... I mean, it's funny looking at the footage now because the people in the studio just... It's no interest. They're just not even bothered. They're going, what was this kind of DJ thing going on? Because they're all kind of new romantic -y kids and stuff like that. But obviously from a DJ culture, you know, anyone who's a DJ who saw it, you know, it kind of had an effect on them. And, um, you know, people like Norman Cook talks about seeing it and stuff. And, you know, even people thinking, well, I could do that, you know, and, and give it a go. So it, it opened the idea of mixing up to, to, to more people. You mentioned Revox. Yeah. Um, and can you tell us what that is? And right, sorry, Revox is Revox B77, reel to reel um, tape recorder. And, you know, it's what I use now. I, I kind of record samples. And so you're still using this thing? Yes, yeah, the you same use unit back from the... back in, you know, um, the early 80s. And how, how, how I came, I started doing mixes for Piccadilly Radio. Uh, you know, once I got, I became known as somebody who mixed. And you've you got to remember at the time, there was only probably a handful of people in the country who were seen as taking this direction seriously. People like Froggy in London, James Hamilton, for sure, you know, like one or two other people, Ian Levine at Heaven, the gay club in London. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that was being done. I mean, I don't think mixing really took over uh, with the majority of DJs until the rave period. It wasn't until the late 80s there was still a lot of DJs using the microphone to that point. Um, so... I did, I did these, mix and, and, and the original mixes I did for the radio were literally as live, but they, they recorded them in the day. So I'd go into Legend in the day, they'd come in, they'd bring one of these um, Revox B77 units in. Now what they were used for, these were portable editing units that were used by like news departments and stuff, who, who on the hop they'd kind of edit as they were going along, and, and so they were, they were built for that purpose. So they'd record the mix there take it back to the studio and did what they called top and tail it, which was put, put blank tape at the beginning and the end so that it was all broadcast ready to be played. And that was it, it was like a live mix at first. And then after, uh, there was one occasion where they didn't have anyone back at the studio to, to edit it and I managed to get myself into an editing booth and I'd been shown the rudiments of like tape editing. I just really got into it and started reversing bits of tape and playing around and messing with beats and stuff like that. Just loved it. And that took me down that kind of path, which was almost like a producer's mind, wanting to work more slowly with the music 
and the mixes started to become more intricate. They'd take me longer to do. No longer was it as live. It was now taking a whole night to kind of put something together and becoming more and more experimental all the time. And, you know, I, I bought my own and, and I bought my SL1200s. And, and, and this is at a time where, you know, only a couple of clubs in the country had SL1200s, you know, and, and nobody had them. Nobody bought them. I think Froggy in London would have had a pair. And I, I had a pair. And, so I had my own little kind of DJ studio that I was working on, making my mixes, and, and the Revox was like integral to that, because apart from, um, you know, we were recording to it then, that was the format you recorded to, you know, and then I could edit things up or, you know, and, and do little kind of tricks and fancy things. But also, um, if you put it into record, and I, I still do this now, and uh, if you put it into record and turn the channel up, so you're recording what's playing out, and then you pull that channel up, it's creating an infinity loop. So it, that's the dub effect. That's what the Jamaicans discovered in the 70s when with dub and everything that, that they, they, they were doing. So, you know, I use it in that way as well. And so, um, you know, it, it has those, those two purposes for me. Why do you still use it? I mean, we have the technology <laughs> today to do those things on the computer, obviously. What's the appeal for you still to be bringing this out? I mean, it, I suppose it's like an instrument, isn't it? It's like you could say to, um, you know, like, you know, a, a guitarist, well, why are you taking the guitar when you could use a keyboard sampler to sample things through? Or, you know, the, the, that's the kind of instrument. That's what they're comfortable with. You know, I mean, I, I, I spin these sounds in. It's, 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 a, it's a way I do it, you know, I, and I have a, an affinity and a feeling for it. Um, I mean, yeah, I suppose that if I wanted to, I could use bits of equipment that would would do something similar to what I do, but it wouldn't be the same thing. It'd be similar. Um, and I also like the idea, I mean, when I started DJing, I mean, I, I never used to use a Revox like that back then. I used it more for mixes, for more, you know, like for radio mixes than, than I did. I didn't use it in a live sense so much. I did on the tube and stuff. So, you know, that, that, that it, it's become, when, when, that's right. When I come back and started again, it was like, how am I going to do this? Am I going to go off CD? Am I going to go off vinyl? I mean, a lot of my records were stolen in the mid-80s after I'd stopped DJing, so there was gaps to be filled. Maybe I had them on CD. So I had some stuff on CD, some on vinyl. The, the third option that appeared was laptop. And in the end, I plumped for that because I wanted to do edits and stuff like that. So I thought, right, we can put everything together. I can you know, rip my vinyl into there, rip my CD into there, and so everything's in one place, I can do my edits. But that was kind of modern technology, that was like, and, and, and at the time, people were still a bit kind of um, weird about it, they didn't like, you know, DJ playing off, off, off laptops and stuff. Um, and I like the idea of having this antiquated technology against the kind of current stuff, it was that balance that I was after. And that, that's the same in, in, in the way I present the music, so, Although I'm taking music from the past, via the re-edits and everything, it's being presented in a contemporary way. So it's not just, I didn't want to fall into a nostalgia trap of, you know, had I come back into it and played the music in the same way as I used to play it, I think there would have been an interest to a certain level where people would have maybe checked me out, ticked me off, I've seen him list and move on to the next guy. But there wouldn't have been any longevity for me. There wouldn't have been any shelf life. Um, but embracing the edits culture, which was second nature, because that's what I was doing back then. I, mean, I was very fortunate that I, hadn't, I wasn't even aware, because I was so out of the loop with things in the years before I came back into DJ, and I hadn't even realized that this re-edits thing was starting to emerge. So walking back into it, it just like hand in glove for me. Um, and, and that enabled me, as I say, to, um, to, to draw from the past, but do it in a way with an eye on the future. So. You've took a long break from DJing, but now you've been back for a while, like a little bit. I'm wondering, you know, now that you've got a handle on things and you're back and you're into it, like what have you, what are you looking forward to now? Now that you've gotten over kind of the shock of whatever the dance music scene looks like and all of these things, now what? Well, I mean, for, for a few years, I mean, even a few years ago, I was still thinking of myself as, as, new, as new back into this. And then 
you come to the realization that you've been doing it longer than you did the first time around. I mean, it was between 75 and 83, so I was at eight years. Now I'm 10 years into this. So, so, and I'm, I'm the type of nature that I've got, to, it's got to be for a reason. I can't just do it to make money or go for the motions. I'd, I'd, I'd hate it. I'd, I'd start, I'd, I'd rebel against it within myself. That's why, one of the reasons why I probably stopped the first time because there was a slight falling out of love with it. So there's, there's got to be something that underpins that. So coming up to the, when it, you know, now it's 10 years, it's a decade, you know, um, I could quite happily in, in many respects go and do my DJ, but I get very well paid for what I do. I can, you know, in the week I could put my slippers on and chill out in front of the telly and, but, you know, that wouldn't work for me. I'd, I'd, I'd fall into those bad ways. So I needed another challenge. And, um, you know, when I wasn't a DJ, I was working in production and management, record labels, those kind of things. And so um, I decided uh, that I wanted to make moves back into into that direction. And as it worked out, somebody that I worked with in the past, a guy called Kermit, who, who I worked with a, with a band called the Ruthless Rap Assassins at the back end of the 80s, early 90s. And he later went on and had big success with um, Black Grape with Sean Ryder from the Happy Mondays. That he, you know, heard some stuff that he'd done that I was really into, and that, you know, that was the fuse points. And um, I've set up a label now called Super Weird Substance. I'm just like two dates into a five date, like mini tour, which is to open the label up. We did Glasgow last night, Manchester last week, and we're off to Liverpool, um, Bristol, and London um, before, you know, I think November the 1st, last gig. And you know, in a sense, it's kind of, it's a whole mad chaotic situation of dealing with loads of people, because not only the band that you've got to deal with, but the people working around the band to put all this on. You know, in the last last few weeks, I've been thinking, well, you know, why have I done this? You know, why do I want to kind of take all this on? Um, but, why? you know, really... Why do you want to take it on again? Be because I think to keep fresh in what you're doing, you have to challenge yourself and... Um, there's unfinished business in that area because, you know, like when I came to the end of, you know, like my line with the, the music business, so to speak, the music business is a, a hard, cruel business because music's about motion. You know, you put your heart and soul into something and then you go into this machine of the music business and really they're interested in pound shillings and pence and, you know, that they're not so much kind of, they'll go with the artistic side of it, it sells. But, if it, you know, they, they, they don't mind. They, they're, they're selling cans of beans, and if it's a nice flavor, that's great, but they don't care if it's a bit grotty, you know, as long as they can get the money in. So they're coming from a different perspective than we are. And at the end of it, for me, I mean, it, it ended hard that I had a project. We were signed to Polydor. Um, for one reason or another, it didn't work out. And I found myself left with, like, a load of tracks that I'd worked on, you know, put everything into for a, a period of about two or three years that never saw the light of day, that only, you know, um, my, my friends, you know, the people around us ever got to hear. And that hurt more than anything. And so later down the line, that's why when, um, you know, like the, the digital age kicked in and, and the internet, and there was the possibility of sharing music and, and, and stuff that, um, you know, that, that's, <coughs> You know, I embrace that. I'd rather give give it away than be put in that position that you put all that work in and that energy and effort and nobody ever gets to hear it. Um, and, and so, you know, at this point in time, I think that, as I say, financially from my DJ work, it, it, it enables me the opportunity to take a risk with this without it being, you know, in the past, I'd take risks with everything. I'd risk it all. You know, I'd risk any money I had on trying, because back then you had to get a studio. It wasn't a case of opening your computer and making a track. If you made a track, you had to book a studio and they weren't cheap. So, you know, it might cost you a thousand pounds to go in and do a couple of, of tracks to a certain level. You weren't even, a, you know, you finished mastering level with it. Um, and I, I, you know, you're either looking to find finance to do that or you were pretty much doing it yourself. You were just like um, finding money from somewhere. Um, whereas now it's different, as I say, I, I can afford to put a little bit of money aside and say, let's, let's have a go at this. And, and that's, that's where I'm at with it at the minute, you know. The, we were talking earlier uh, backstage about 
the events, and it yeah. seems like the, obviously you're DJing at them, but there's a live band, and then there's all these other elements. Is yeah, that I something mean, that's important to you to have this? Yeah, I like the idea of, um, you know, like bringing in different aspects and kind of shaking things up a little bit, and, and the fact that, um, you know, w what we're doing is we're we're starting off with talks. We're, you know, we're we're having a guest in, and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of talking, and, and Kermit, who's who's in a Blind Arcade, uh, then it moves into a more kind of arts-based thing where we, we invite different artists to contribute. You know, like drawing influence from from what we're doing. Uh, you know, with, with DJ playing, but not so much in terms of like wanting to kind of fill a dance floor, but just playing good music. Then the band plays, and then it goes into a normal club thing at the end, and I'll I'll, I'll finish it off. So it's a multimedia thing. It's it's um, we call them super weird happenings. The label's called Super Weird Substance, and the the, the term happening is a '60s term that um, was basically artistic events that were with with a spontaneity to them. Um, and these things were happening back then, and, and that's what I'm trying to kind of you know touch into. You know, to, and and it, and it does have that. You, you know, each one will be different, and. It go. It finds its own direction. It's not set in stone. It's not perfectly rehearsed. It's something that allows that kind of spontaneity. And they've been like mad, you know, this kind of glorious chaos, which which everyone's like really enjoyed. You said you had a barber last night. Yeah, last night one of the artists was a barber um, that came in and just like did these mad kind of extreme haircuts with people. If they wanted to kind of put themselves in his chair and stuff. So yeah, it's one of those where you're looking around and. You, you see things that you wouldn't normally see in, in, in a club environment. And um, yeah, I mean, really what I want to do with this is take it into festivals. I think its natural state is within a festival. I want to take an area of a festival, curate the day, program it. So as I say, in the day, it would start off, say, you get, you'd be in the festival, you get out of your bed after a, a late night the night before, but you could come in and listen to some interesting talk, what was going on with people. And then, you know, as I say, different artistic things happening like bands playing and, and eventually into a full on kind of club vibe. So that's where I see it going and, and hopefully that's what I'm gonna be doing next year with it. Plus one, you know, standalone one off events here and there at interesting places. So cool. Well I'd like to open up to questions. Mm -hmm. Um see if anyone has anything they'd like to to know about Greg or his career. Does anyone have Come anything? On, don't be shy. <laughs> I think B Balearic really initially was basically in Ibiza, DJs playing pop music and rock music rather than black dance music. Um, and that was happening in the UK. There were plenty of places that were, were doing that, but obviously they, they weren't under the term Balearic. I think that what was recognized in Ibiza and the island and you know the setting and everything was, was a certain spirit to music that was brought back um, and you know that's where the term you know the term derives from of course um, so so yeah I mean Belair I think it was important because we were, we were quite snobby about pop music as, as DJs you know black music was the real stuff that was the proper dance music um, you know all this kind of but but you know there are obviously great great dance records that come from from that direction so I think it had an importance in that respect in, in maybe you know, telling us that, you know, it, it didn't have to be one way or whatever. But you certainly wouldn't identify yourself as one. Well, I mean, <coughs> interestingly, um, I think it was Terry Farley, he described me as a Balearic DJ these days. And I, you know, I, th I think I can see what he, he, he means, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm picking from a, a wide spectrum of music and a wide history of music, and, you know, it can come from anywhere. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, I... I Whereas I say in the past, I, I was a different kind of DJ that it had to, it had to be generally imported out of somewhere like New York. It was by black or Latino artists, you know, that you, you had all these stipulations. I mean, one of the things about when I DJ at Legend, you know, I always look back and I'm always a bit sad that I never played uh, Trap by Yazoo. Um, it was the Francois Kavorki mix of Situation. And that was like, felt like one step too far at the time. 
I mean, because I, I took so much stick for playing things like Buffalo Gals by Malcolm McLaren, because on the black music side, they were like, you know, he wasn't he the manager of the Sex Pistols? You're playing this punk guy, you know, and they, they, they just saw you kind of moving away from it. So the idea of playing like a British pop out, like your zoo, but I should have done it really, you know what I mean? And, and, and you know, people like Yellow, you know, the Swiss band and stuff. And, and I, I think I actually did play a couple of Yellow tracks towards the end of that time. Um, so yeah, you, there, was, there was a degree of snobbishness. And I think that in Ibiza with ecstasy in that environment, it, it opened it up and those guys that, that witnessed that and brought it back, you know, that, that's what they, they experienced. And, and um, yeah, I think it was an important addition. And it was, again, it was reminding us that, you know, music's music and, you know, we don't get too kind of tied up in what you think's like credible and not credible in a sense. Just listen and, and you hear it, you know. Are there any other questions? Well, I mean, straight away, I think <clears throat> re-edit, what it does is it, it enables it to be brought into a current context. I mean, say, for example, it might be a 70s track, 70s disco track, but it, it's got, like, a real drummer. It's got, like, um, you know, like, it's not in strict time. So from a mixing point of view, it, it's not easy to mix for a starter. God knows how those guys in the 70s mixed a lot of the, you know, and they say, oh, it's such and such. It, must, it must have been like a couple of beats and then, you know, the next record played, you know, if you, if you listen back, if you, if, you, if you manage to get like a window back in on that time. Um, so th what this does is, is it enables you to contemporize the classic track. I think, say, for example, in the 90s, you know, a lot of uh, older records were, um, you know, that the people were using them, but they were just putting a straight 4-4 house beat and housing them up. That's not what, what's happening now. It's almost like, they, they appreciate that these are great records in their own sense, and there's nothing wrong with them as such, apart from the fact that they need to mix into them, need to kind of make, maybe they need to add some bottom end that wasn't about at that time to make them sound right in that environment. And, and, and that's what it does, you know. And so what I've noticed like down the years is, is how the audience has got younger year on year and, and people come in, to, you know, that, that connect with this type of music that now we're getting into like people who are teenagers who, who, who are getting into it, hearing the mixes online and hearing these edits and really getting into them and stuff. So, so I think to meet those people, you can't go to somebody who's young and say, you know, listen, you've got to kind of, in my day it was all better and you know, this music then, you lose them straight away. You've got to meet them and, and be respectful to where they're coming from. So if you can present that music to them in a way that fits in with now, i.e. you can mix it in with, 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 with what you're doing and against contemporary tracks as well, they'll warm to it because really, you know, it's, 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 it's just great music when it boils down to it. It's, it's just, um, yeah, and, and I also think, you know, I've had a few conversations this year about, um, especially in Ibiza, you know, because there, there was a feeling in Ibiza, you know, people driving me between gigs and people at the club that I worked in and stuff, that there was a real dissatisfaction with the music there, and I think it's come from the whole EDM thing, that now, even though I think Ibiza was part of the problem, that it's gone too far for them, and, and like promoters and stuff are all of a sudden saying, you know what, I don't even like the music that we're, we're playing in the clubs anymore, you know, it's got to that stage. And, and I was just doing what I did and playing my, my thing, and, and, and they were like, as though I was doing something new, although this, I've been doing it ever since i come back. But, it's the emotion within it, I th and I think that, you know, like the vocals, the musicianship, these emotional aspects of the music that, and I was talking to a DJ from Berlin who, who, who put it in the terms that, you know, music has been technical for too long, too technical for too long, and that we are coming into a more emotional period, maybe because of the austerity of the times, we're living in strange times and everything, people need a kind of uplift, and all of a sudden, these tracks like take on a, a different context that allow people to go out let go of everything that's going on in the world whereas you know you know a lot of a lot of dance music 
is very intricate, you know, in terms of its own little niche, you know. So, so people who are into that side of it appreciate it, but on, they appreciate it on, on technicalities, you know, on, you know, beat structures and stuff, and you know, like, and and the the that's that's good in its own context, but when it's all the time, when it's you know, to to the de you know, the, there's nothing else happening apart from that, you know, that. Um, you know, I think that, that it, it does need, you know, like something more human introducing. I mean, I, I, I blogged about the Daft Punk album when it came out because I thought that was a real moment, what, what they were doing, where, where they were at the point where, with this EDM thing hitting a height, they could take their place on the throne and be the kings of EDM, and it was there for them. And instead, they rejected it, and they said that music's lost its direction, and what they were looking at doing was bringing back into it musicianship. Now Rogers, obviously, things like that. Pharrell Williams, and and, and 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 you know, I think from that, that will influence younger people, younger musicians. Um, you know, to to look at music in a slightly different way than maybe people did. You know, or certainly dance music than they did. You know, like five or ten years ago. So I do. I, you know, I believe that we're moving more into an emotional aspect at this point in time. Um, we're uh, out of time, but I'm sure Greg uh, will be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have um, along the way, either after this or tonight at the club. Um, there will be tickets uh, on the door uh, available if uh, you haven't already got them. Uh, Greg will be playing along with Terry Hooley and uh, Noel Watson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Ashley Beadle. Uh, yeah, Ashley Beadle and as well. So, pretty stellar lineup. Uh, thank you very much for coming today and uh, enjoy the rest of the weekender. Thank you.